Egypt. The Gorgon's Head Acrisius, king of Argos, came home from Delphi with a heavy heart, for he had received a dreadful oracle. No sons shall be born to you, the priestess had told him, but you shall have a grandson, and by his hand you shall die. Now the king had an only daughter who was yet a maiden. So in his distress he thought, I will evade my fate. I will shut Danae up away from the sight of men in a house of bronze all sunk underground. And he carried out his cruel plan. But Acrisius forgot to take the gods into account. Part of the roof of the house was open to the sky. And one day, as lovely Danae sat sadly looking up at the passing clouds, Zeus beheld the maiden, changing himself into a shower of gold. He stormed into her chamber. When afterwards a son was born to Danae, she hid him from her father's sight. Nevertheless, the king discovered the baby and was more than ever filled with fear. He dared not kill little Perseus directly, lest the gods avenge the murder. Instead, he had a great chest built, placed Danae and her boy in it, and set them adrift upon the sea. All day and all night, the chest tossed upon the waves. Danae lulled her child with song, and he slept. But when the dawn came, a great wave picked up the chest and carried it close to the tiny island of Seraphos. It happened that a fisherman, Dictis by name, saw the chest bobbing on the waves close to the shore. He dragged the box to land and opened it. When he beheld the pitiful mother with the helpless little child, his heart was moved. He took them both to his wife, for Dictis was childless. And there, in the kindly fisherfolk's humble home, Perseus grew up. Now Danae had been a beautiful maiden, and when Perseus has grown into a fine tall youth, she was still beautiful. So it was not strange that King Polydectes, who was Dictis' brother, fell in love with her and made her his wife. But the king hated the youth just because Danae doted on him and sought some way to get rid of him. At last, Polydectes said to his stepson, the time has come, Perseus, for you to win glory for yourself in some bold adventure. Young Perseus thought so too. But what should the adventure be? I think, the wily Polydectus said, it would be a good idea for you to cut off the Medusa's head. That would bring you to the greatest fame. All unsuspecting, Perseus set off to find the Medusa not knowing in the least how perilous an adventure he had undertaken. For the Medusa was one of the three Gorgons, terrible winged monsters who lived alone on an island. They had teeth like the tusk of a boar, hands of brass, and snakes instead of hair. Perseus did not know where to look for the Gorgons, nor did he know which of them was Medusa. And this was important, for Medusa was the only one of the three that could be slain. From place to place, the prince went on his quest, getting more and more discouraged. Then one day, he beheld a young man of great beauty, wearing winged sandals and a winged cup, and carrying in his hand a wand around which two golden serpents twined. Perseus knew at once that this was her mess, and was overjoyed when the god said, Perseus, I approve the high adventure you have in mind, but you must be properly equipped for it. Without the winged sandals, the magic wallet, and the helmet of invisibility, it will be difficult for you to slay Medusa. But I will take you to the Grey Women. You can find out from them. And will they indeed tell me? Perseus asked. Not willingly, Hermes replied but you can make them do it. They have but one eye shared among the three. Snatch it from them as they pass it from one to another and none can see. And do not give it back 
till they tell you what you want to know. With that, Hermes gave Perseus a magnificent curved sword. You will need it, he said, for Medusa's scales are hard as metal. Perseus had just taken the sword when there was a sudden brightness in the sky, and he beheld the goddess Athene descending toward them. Of what use will be your sword, my brother? She said to Hermes, when none may look the gorgons and live. The sight of them, as you well know, turns men into stone. Take my bright shield, Perseus. Look into it instead of at the monster as you approach to do battle, and you will see the Medusa reflected as in a mirror. And the goddess left. On and on with God companion, Perseus journeyed farther than man had ever been. At last, they came to the end of the earth. There, the weird gray women sat, passing their eye from one to another, just as her mess had said. The nay's son knew what to do. He left the god and crept quietly towards them, waited till one had taken the eye from her forehead, and snatched it away as she passed it to her sister. The gray women raised a fearful clamor when they realized that a stranger had their eye. They howled and they threatened, but without the eye, they were helpless, and in the end, they grudgingly told Perseus the way to the nymphs of the north. So again, Perseus went on, this time to find the happy beings who possessed the three priceless things he needed. And when the nymphs heard the reason he wanted them, they were willing to give him the winged shoes, the helmet that would make him invisible, and the magic wallet that would become the right size for whatever he wished to carry. Fully equipped now, Perseus lightly sped through the air over land and over sea to the fearful island of the Gorgons. As he approached, he could see, scattered in the fields and along the roads, statues of men and beasts whom the sight of the Gorgons had turned stone. And at last, from high above, he beheld the monsters themselves reflected in his shield. Their scale-covered bodies glistened in the sand. Their great wings were folded, and the snakes that were their hair lay hideously coiled and intertwined. The gorgons were asleep. But which of the three was Medusa? Perseus could see no difference among them. Suddenly, he heard Athena's voice. Descend, Perseus, and strike. The gorgon nearest the shore is Medusa. Perseus swept down, and still gazing into the shield, boldly swung his blade. With one stroke, he cut off the grisly head. Then, springing into the air, he thrust his prize, all wreathing and hissing into the magic wallet. Up leaped the gorgon sisters, for they heard the rattle of Medusa's scales as the severed body thrashed about. They turned their snaky heads, and when they saw Perseus, they roared with fury. Flapping their great wings, they set off in pursuit, but they could not outstrip the winged sandals. Over lands and people, the hero flew on and on. He had lost his way now, for her mess had left him. Below, the Libyan desert stressed endlessly. Perseus did not know what those sands were, nor did he guess that the ruby drops falling from Medusa's head were turning into venomous snakes that would inhabit the desert forever. But now, he saw a sight that made his heart beat fast with excitement and wonder. Fastened by chains to a cliff by the sea was a beautiful maiden. Perseus almost forgot to keep his winged sandals moving, so struck was he by her rare beauty. I pray, you tell me your name and why you are bound like this. I am Andromeda, she said, daughter of Cepheus, king of Ethiopian. The beautiful Kashapea is my mother. It is her beauty that has chained me here, for the gods are jealous, and in nothing may we mortals surpass them. The day my mother vaunted herself fairer than the daughters of Nereus, 
the sea god has sent a serpent to prey upon our people, and my death alone can appease his anger. So says the oracle. Enough of tears, Perseus said to them sternly. I am Perseus, son of Zeus and Danae. Now I will make this contract with you, that Andromeda shall be mine if I save her from the serpent. Indeed, indeed, valorous youth, she shall be yours. Only save her from the monster, and you shall have our kingdom as well as our daughter. Perseus sprang into the air and shot high up in the clouds and buried his sword up into the beast's right shoulder. On and on he struck the monster with his sword that lead to its death. I will take fair maiden without dowry, Perseus said. And that very day, the wedding was celebrated. Now, while the marriage feast was at its height, the door of the banquet hall was suddenly flung open, and in burst of a mob of shouting riotous men. Foremost stood Andromeda's uncle, Phineas, with a javelin in hand. Behold, I am here, he cried. I have come to avenge the theft of my promised bride. Phineas said not a word. He looked from the king to Perseus, and decided at which to aim his weapon, then hurled it at the hero. The spear stuck in Perseus' couch. Then the rioters went wild. Weapons were hurled, and the feast turned into a battle. Thick as hail, javelins sped by Perseus' ears. He set his shoulders against a great stone column and struck down one man after another. But at least he realized that valor could not withstand the numbers against him. If I have any friends here, let them hide their faces, he shouted. With this, he drew Medusa's head out of the wallet. Two hundred men became stony statues before Phineas. Phineas cried, Put away your horrible weapon. Hide it. Grant me only my life and may the rest be yours. What I can give you, most cowardly Phineas, I will. Perseus replied, You shall be a lasting monument here in the palace of my father-in-law. The unhappy Phineas tried to turn away his eyes, but even as he did so, his flesh turned to stone. When at the year's end, Perseus stayed home with Andromeda. Polydectus' hatred had in no way lessened. The king was furious that his stepson had returned, and refused to believe that he actually slain the Medusa. I shall prove to you that what I say is true, he cried. Hide your eyes, all you who are my friends. And he showed the gorgon's head to cruel Polydectus. That was the last time Perseus ever used the horrible head he gave it most willingly to Athene, who kept it ever after. Now that Polydectus was dead, the Ney yearned to go home again and be reconciled with her father. So Perseus made the fisherman Dictys king of island and sailed with his mother and Andromeda to Greece. But it happened that when they came to Argos, King Acritius was away from home. Games were being held in Larissa, and Perseus, Hearing of them, decided to go there and take part. And there at the game, it was that the oracle which Acritius had received at Delphi was strangely fulfilled. For when it came to Perseus' turn to throw the discus, he threw it so hard that it swerved to one side. It landed among the spectators and killed an old man. That old man was King Acritius, who had gone to such cruel lengths to avoid the fate which the gods had ordained.